Hope your work week is off to a good start. This is the Daily Report for Monday, November 8th. I'm Min San He. We've marked the first one week since the launch of our exit strategy from COVID-19. And in today's panel session, we assess related efforts and existing challenges. We start now with the global pandemic updates. I have Kwon Soa standing by. Soa, welcome. Hello, Asani. Right, let's begin with the latest here on the local front then. Sure, so week two of our first phase towards a return to normalcy started off with 1,760 COVID-19 infections that were tallied as of 12 a.m. And that includes so 1,733 domestic transmissions and 27 cases from abroad. A little over 700 cases were posted in the capital Seoul, 544 in Gyeonggi-do province, a little under 100 in Inter. Uh, meanwhile, 60 or more than 60 in Gyeongsangbuk-do province as well as Chungcheongnam-do province, respectively. Now, we had some concerning numbers over the weekend as cases have been lingering in the 2000s. And uh, with that, uh, the domestic, uh, the average number of domestic daily cases is now standing at above 2,000. Now, Korea has posted 13 additional fatalities, which has led to the total number of deaths here to 2,980. And the number of patients that are currently in severe or critical conditions stands at 409. That's four more than Sunday. And also in the past three days, uh, the number of people in that condition has been at above 400. Now let's move over to our vaccination figures. 80.9% of the nation's population, or 41.5 million, have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And 76.6%, or 39.3 uh, million, are fully vaccinated. Going abroad, uh, we have uh, reached a milestone, a grim milestone in total infections over the weekend, now with over 250 million accumulated cases of the coronavirus. If we go over to some countries with the highest figures here, there's been more than 39,000 new infections posted in the UK and more than 39,000 in Russia. Meanwhile, over the weekend, Russia had a record high of over 41,000 cases on Saturday. Also, Germany is seeing still resurgences with more than 20,000 infections posted in the past 24 hours as of noon Korea time. And those are the general updates I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny? All right, so thank you for now. Right, this past Saturday and Sunday, people nationwide ushered in their first weekend amid eased social restrictions. For more on that, I have Shin Yeun here in the studio. Yeun, welcome. Pleasure to be here, Sunny. Right, so Yeun, let's begin with the scenes from the streets this past weekend. Right, so as you might have expected, life returned to the streets and businesses were thriving. As for me, I went to a movie theater over the weekend and it was a bit strange for me to try popcorn and soda while watching a movie. It's been such a long time. And that's what actually people can do for those who have been fully vaccinated. And other busy locations filled with people over the weekend were places of worship like churches and temples. They can fill up to 50% of their capacity regardless of the vaccination status of the gathered worshipers. There's also no attendance cap if all of the worshipers are fully vaccinated or if they submit a negative PCR test result. This is a notable departure compared to when the toughest rules were in place. Under previous restrictions, places of worship were only allowed to fill 10% of their total capacity for in-person religious services, and the streets in general were bustling with crowds of people, with the cap on social gatherings being raised to 10 people in the Greater Seoul area and 12 people in other regions. Right. Now, you and I hear restrictions are also being lifted at Han River Parks here in Capitals Hall. That's totally right. Starting today, drinking outside of the parks lining the Hangang River will be allowed once again. Back in July, health authorities had prohibited people from drinking at these areas past 10 p.m. The Seoul Metropolitan Government lifted this ban on Monday, hoping to give some breathing room for businesses set up on the banks of the Hangang River. People will be able to drink here after 10 p.m. as long as they wear their masks and meet in groups of no more than 10 people. Right, and Yeon, do tell us a bit more about the latest on the vaccination front, which is something that our colleague Sua touched upon earlier. Right, as Sua said, as of Monday, 76% of the country's population have been fully vaccinated. And with Korea fast approaching the 80% milestone, health authorities have started administering booster shots to tackle breakthrough cases in high-risk groups. Beginning on this Monday, recipients of the Janssen vaccine are getting their booster doses. This group had so far accounted for the most breakthrough cases in the country, 
and those who got their uh, Janssen vaccine at least two months ago are eligible for an extra jab, which comes to around 1.48 million people. And these people can choose between Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, and those over the age of 30 can opt to get another Janssen jab. I see. And on the treatment front, Yeon, do tell us a bit about the antiviral pills by both Merck and Pfizer. Right, the hottest pills in town are actually those made of Pfizer called Paxlovid and Merck's Molnupiravir. And let me explain how each one works. If you'll just look at the graph that's up on the screen right now, um, you can see that first both Paxlovid and Molnupiravir have shown to be quite effective in lowering the number of hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19. Pfizer's Paxlovid cuts the risk by 89%, whereas Merck's Molnupiravir reduced it by around half. Both are five-day courses, and you'd, you need to take six pills a day for Paxlovid and eight a day for Molnupiravir. And Pfizer is hoping to distribute enough pills to cover 180,000 people by the end of this year, which will later be expanded to 50 million. And Merck is set on distributing 10 million people's worth by the end of this year and 20 million by 2022. Right, and stay with distribution efforts, um, Yeon. How many of these pills have been secured by South Korea thus far? Right, so on Sunday, health authorities said they would secure a total of 404,000 courses of the treatment by the end of this month. Back in September, authorities secured some 200,000 courses from Merck and 70,000 courses from Pfizer. They said talks to secure an extra 134,000 courses are still ongoing with Pfizer, Merck, and with even a Swiss company, Roche, that is also working on a similar drug. If the deals go ahead as planned, these pills may become available in Korea within the first quarter of next year. Right, the first quarter of next year, that's good to know. Right then, thank you for now, Yeon. Stay with us for the extended talk. Right, today, that is Monday's decline in daily infections has been largely linked to the weekend factor, and the latest findings on the weekly trend show a rather grim reality. So I's back with more on that, right, So. Right, Sunny. So because the average number of domestic infections in the past week has surpassed the 2,000 threshold for the first time in five weeks, uh, cases also rose by around 24 percent on week. And also the reproduction rate of the COVID-19 virus stands at 1.2, and that's also a rise for the third straight week. Now, not only have the numbers in general gone up, but so has the number of critically ill patients as well as COVID-19 related deaths. In a span between October 30th to November 6th, an average of 365 people a day were in serious or a critical condition, which is up from 333 the week before. Roughly 8 out of 10 were people aged 60 and above. 126 people have lost their lives in the past week, and uh, according to a government analysis on 452 deaths in the past five weeks, around 72 percent were un vaccinated and close to 90 percent were seniors aged 60 and above. Right. So and against the backdrop, are authorities expecting a further surge in cases then? Well, Sonny, we have been expecting a rise in cases ever since we transitioned into the first phase of living with the COVID-19 strategy. Uh, but now the question is to what extent, uh, because there are now talks about uh, whether this week we could see infections rise up to 3,000 or not. Now, officials are saying that Tuesday and Wednesday's figure uh, are really important in uh, deciding whether this is another upward trend. Uh, now, meanwhile, especially because now it's been a week after we have transitioned into this new strategy, but also a week after the Halloween weekend. Uh, this is why there is a chance that we are seeing a, a higher number of reach surgences. But uh, meanwhile, officials are also saying that uh, the booster shot campaign could be something that could turn around uh, the figure we're seeing right now, uh, not in the immediate uh, future, but uh, once the elderly population that are receiving their booster shot so have again more immunity against the virus. Right. And so if cases do go up this week, will they remain within medical capacity? Uh, well, so the officials uh, have been acknowledging that despite medical capacity being manageable at the moment, medical personnel are already facing some difficulties here and there. And uh, this was one of the reasons for why the government last week decided to expand hospital beds, uh, but not only in number, but also in a more efficient manner. Let's take a listen.
That is a fact we considered when the administrative order was issued on November 5th. The order was for the expansion of hospital beds for moderately ill patients, not ICU beds. In a situation where it's difficult to transfer a patient to a regular hospital room after he or she has recovered somewhat in the ICU, we have created these new beds for moderately ill patients that can serve as a bridge between the two. Now, despite this systematic change, though, he added that the government will also make efforts in either employing more medical staff or supporting them in other ways. Medical capacity, however, remains stable as of this Monday, with 45.6% of hospital beds for seriously to critically ill patients available, close to 50% vacancy at residential treatment centers, and almost 500 people allocated for home treatment on Sunday, uh, most of those concentrated in the the metropolitan region. Right. And so you spoke of a possible retreat in COVID-19 infections among the elderly amid the presence of booster shots. But what about the jump in transmissions among teenagers? Uh, well, Sunny, that has been a concern uh, lately because uh, most um, infections, cluster infections, uh, happened at either uh, nursing facilities or education facilities such as schools or cram schools. And uh, in particular, the government says this month in November, there's been a rise in infections among those aged under 18. And November also happens to be the month uh, when the college entrance exam uh, takes place. So let's take a listen to an official on how the government is preparing for this big day. As November 18th is the day of the Sunung exam, we need to focus on curbing the risk of transmission among students. This is why the government is planning to concentrate on inspection of how prevention guidelines are being followed at venues often used by students, such as cram schools, PC rooms, singing rooms, and study cafes. Right, now November 18th, that is next Thursday, would be the second Sunung Day marked by the country since the start of the pandemic here in Korea. And for a bit about how the uh, preparations were made last year, I'm going to turn back to Yeon. Tell us a bit about how things went during last year's Sunung. Right, so last year they postponed the exam date by two weeks from its usual date, which is the third Thursday of November. So last year's Sunung was originally set for November 17th, but it ended up taking place on December 3rd. Students also had a much different curriculum compared to this year. They'd miss out on so many class days due to the pandemic. If you recall, back in March of 2020, when students were set to start their spring semester, cluster infections were reported at places of worship and nightlife venues in Itaewon. So a lot of schools and private academies were forced to shut down. It was only in May when in-person learning was resumed for high school seniors on a limited basis. I see. And now given the presence of vaccines, I'm assuming that the scene is going to look a bit different this year. Yeah, definitely. Based on what they experienced last year, health, uh, health and education authorities have made through very thorough preparations, especially since the number of test takers has risen by more than 16,000 compared to last year, and more than 95% of the students and faculty have been vaccinated. Last month, they decided to set aside 2,895 separate exam rooms for students reporting COVID-19 symptoms, on the day of Sunung, 112 test centers are also available for students in quarantine on top of 31 hospitals and two treatment centers for students who contracted the virus. They also decided to take down the fiberglass partitions installed on each student's desk because many have complained that this took up a lot of space on their desks, making it very inconvenient to take the test. So this year, only paper partitions will be put up during lunchtime when students take off their masks. Right, I see. And while those preparations are being made for the big day, so I understand transmissions within the academic arena persist. Right, Sunny. So let's take a uh, closer look at some examples here. In the capital Seoul, for instance, there's been a cluster infection recently linked to a high school. And uh, the problem there is, although uh, most of the infections occurred among those in their first or second grade, so not those that have to take their exam next week, but still, uh, because of this infection, uh, there's been 
even a higher uh, risk of these leading to secondary transmissions to cram schools because many of those cram schools are situated near that school in Gangnam district in the capital Seoul. Now in Chungcheongbuk-do province, meanwhile, uh, as of lately, there has been uh, three major cluster infections at middle schools, one at a high school and another at a cram school. Uh, down in Jeollabuk-do province, there has been a cluster infection linked to an elementary school, uh, which has a total of 50 uh, infections. And in Gyeongsangbuk-do province, there's also been 15 new cases linked to uh, students uh, as of this Monday. So there have been quite a number of uh, cluster infections that broke out at schools uh, lately. And although we've got senior high school students vaccinated ahead of, an, uh, ahead of any other teens, to some extent, there are higher risks of transmissions than last year when there was a higher proportion of remote classes. Uh, this is why authorities are stressing the benefits of getting vaccinated, but are also calling for the following. We ask students who use public facilities to actively comply with all prevention guidelines, such as wearing their face masks when indoors. Also, if you have any suspected symptoms, please get tested for the virus immediately. So individual compliance is what she has been stressing there. Right, of course it is. Right then, so thank you for those updates. And uh, Yeon, I'll see you again tomorrow. That is Tuesday. See you. Across the border this past Sunday, North Korea conducted an artillery fire competition and pundits are seeking to explain Kim Jong-un's absence from the event. Kim Dami reports. Pyongyang State Media reported Sunday that North Korea carried out an artillery fire competition the day before in an effort to boost the regime's defense capabilities. The leader Kim Jong-un was not present at the site. Instead, Park Jong-chun, a member of the Presidium of the Power Bureau of the Ruling Party, guided the event. Though it's unusual for the North to showcase such a competition without their leader present, an expert noted that it's a part of Gim's governing style. Ever since the Eighth Party Congress in January, Kim Jong-un has designated other officials in the economic and defense fields to watch over areas, including military drills. Another expert pointed out that Gim's absence could be an attempt by the North to downplay the event, insisting that such activities are ordinary and purely defensive, while at the same time sending a message to the U.S. and its allies. Pyongyang has a long urged Washington to drop so-called double standards over military activities as well as hostile policies against the regime. It seems that the North is showing a low-intensity provocation related to the North's recent statement urging for Washington's withdrawal of double standards and hostile policies. The regime's weekly propaganda publication over the weekend also criticized the recent hard Washington joint air exercises, slamming that the nature of such activity cannot be weakened whether they are scaled down or behind closed doors. Kim Dami, Arirang News. And in Beijing, starting on this Monday until Thursday this week, China's Communist Party hosts a plenary session that reportedly looks to shape the country's political landscape for the years to come. Our Kim Hyo-sun explains. The Chinese Communist Party on Monday will kick off the sixth plenary session of the 19th Central Committee, the party's highest governing body. Hundreds of the country's most powerful people, including members of the party leadership, ministers and regional party chiefs, are in Beijing for the four-day closed-door session. The session is being held ahead of next year's National Congress, during which a major leadership reshuffle is expected with the appointment of a new committee. The gathering is likely to issue a resolution aimed at reassessing the party's 100-year history. It will also likely cement President Xi Jinping's status as an impact-making leader alongside Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. This pundit say will fortify the authority of Xi who currently holds all three of China's power centers, General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, Chairman of the powerful Central Military Commission, as well as the presidency. The resolution is also likely to pave the way for an unprecedented third term for Xi, made possible with a constitutional amendment in 2018, which removed the two-year limit for the country's president. 
Chi's predecessors retired under the previous mandatory rule of two five-year terms or completion at 68 years of age. Kim Yeo-san, Arida News. U.S. President Joe Biden is looking to host a virtual summit on democracy with over 100 countries, including South Korea, on December 9th and 10th. According to Reuters this past Sunday, the online gathering is the first of its kind and follows Mr. Biden's earlier campaign pledge to regain global leadership against, quote, authoritarian forces led by China and Russia. Meanwhile, the invite list reportedly includes mature democracies such as France and Sweden, as well as countries where activists say democracy is under threat, such as the Philippines and Poland. The list does not include Thailand or Vietnam. And from the Middle East, Israel and Iraq were among the few countries invited, while Egypt and Turkey were not. Meanwhile, tensions are escalating over in Iraq following a failed assassination attempt against the Prime Minister there. Here's Kim bo -kyung. Iraq's Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kadimi has survived what the Iraqi military called an attempted assassination on Sunday. Drones laden with explosives targeted Baghdad's fortified green zone on Sunday, where the residence of the country's prime minister is located. Al-Kadimi managed to escape, however, seven of his security personnel were injured. The country's state-run news network, quoting Ministry of Interior spokesman General Sadman, said two of three drones were shot down by Iraqi military after being launched from close to the Republic Bridge on the River Tigris, with one hitting the residents. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, yet it comes amid raised tensions in the country after a general election result was disputed by Iran-backed militia groups. Shortly after reports surfaced, Mustafa al-Kadimi took to Twitter to reassure the public and appeared in video footage published by his office chairing a meeting with top security commanders to discuss the drone attack. As you know, my house was targeted yesterday by a cowardly attack, a direct attack. This cowardly attack is not the work of brave people. This act does not represent Iraqis and does not represent the will of Iraqis. Leaders from other countries widely criticized the attack. In a statement on Sunday local time, U.S. President Joe Biden strongly condemned the terrorist attack and said he was relieved that the Iraqi PM was not injured. Stressing that the perpetrators must be held accountable, he added how he instructed the U.S. national security team to offer all appropriate assistance to Iraq's security forces as they investigate this attack and identify those responsible. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson also joined in the criticism and conveyed his sympathy to those injured. Through a phone call between a Johnson and Karimi, he reportedly said that UK stands by the Iraqi people and supports Karimi's efforts to form a government following elections, which is vital for the long-term stability of Iraq. Kim bo -kyung, Arirang News. On the local front, the future of farming is looking quite different amid the presence of artificial intelligence. Our Kim Chung ah shows us how. A robot shaped like a box enters a farm with 200 or so cows. The robot moves by itself, feeding the cows by meticulously calculating how much feed goes in front of each cow and when and how many times the cows need to be fed. It's topped with a highly sensitive electronic scale and can supply set amounts of feed in precise ways. About 2,400 kilos of feed need to be given to these cows every day. For a person, this may be near impossible, but one robot can get the job done. With the robot, I just need to fill it up with feed for an hour every four to five days and the system does the rest. This robot can help milk cows. Once a cow comes within the robot's range, the robot milks it, washes it, and even disinfects the area. This duck farm has a robot that evenly spreads litter on the floor, which is said to be the most laborious part of raising ducks. With automation, it's easier and more convenient for the farmer as they don't need to worry about the dust or excrement that gets kicked up. Recently, the agriculture sector has been challenged with an aging population. With robots and automation equipment, we hope to reduce the time and energy taken into managing livestock. These various robots in the agriculture sector are expected to continue to boost the short-handed industry in the years to come. Kim Chung-ah, 
Arirangnews. And a cultural village in Korea's southeastern city of Ulsan is offering visitors the chance to fully indulge in children's games that are being featured in the Netflix K-drama series Squid Game. Our Ian Jin shows us some of those scenes from that village. What used to be an empty lot has been turned into the playground from Squid Game. People of all ages are gathering at the Whale Culture Village in Changsengpo, Ulsan to take part in games featured in the Netflix TV series. Children cannot watch Squid Game, but its popularity has spread around schools. It's been a lot of fun coming out here to play the different games from Squid Game with the children. From marbles to tracing shapes on Dalgona candy, as well as the Korean version of Red Light, Green Light, some participants also reenact scenes from the show. The Tangsengpo Whale Culture Village was created in 2015 to show what the village looked like in the 60s and 70s when whale hunting was prevalent. And now, thanks to the TV show, more than 10,000 people visit each weekend. Thank you for visiting this place to experience memories from the lifestyle of our past. We will do our best to take care of this neighborhood to preserve our memories. This whale culture village serves as a place for adults to reminisce about the past and as a family play playground for the younger generations. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Autumn rain has been falling here in Capitol's Hall, and for a glimpse of the season's sights and sounds, our Chan Song Cho joins us now from the Toksung Stonewall walkway. Song Cho, welcome. Good afternoon, Sunny. So I see you're surrounded by the colors of autumn, Song Cho. Yes, but it's so unfortunate that it's raining today. Uh, I mean, if it weren't for this wet, gloomy weather, I would have been better able to show you how beautiful it gets here at the Toksugung Stonewall walkway uh, with the beautiful autumn foliage. But I'm still going to make the best out of it today and turn it into a romantic and melancholic stroll on a rainy autumn day. So let's go. So yes, of course, first of all, over the stone wall is the Toksugung Palace, one of the four major royal palaces in Seoul. And because the palace is located at the corner of Seoul's busiest downtown intersection, uh, the walkway and the palace is not only very accessible by public transportation, but it, it's also very unique by a mix of uh, modern and traditional architecture. And I'm, I was quite surprised to see a lot of people on the street today because of the weather and also the palace is closed on Monday. But yes, the palace is open to the public to explore freely. And there's always some kind of special exhibition going on inside the palace. And uh, look at the beautiful autumn foliage. Isn't it very beautiful? Um, and also with the living with COVID-19 strategies in place, guided tours have resumed and also discounts are available for group visits as well. And uh, you know that Toksugung is very famous for its night visits as well uh, because you can experience the palace in a very special way with beautiful lights on at night. And, uh, you, and there's also the backdrop of the beautiful Seoul's skyscrapers as well. So that's something that you definitely don't want to miss out. So this walkway is arguably the most romantic and beautiful uh, walkway in Seoul. Uh, each year it gets selected as one of the best places for a stroll in Seoul by the Korea Tourism Organization. And it gets especially magical in fall because of these ginkgo trees and their spectacular yellow foliage. I mean, yes, most of the leaves have fallen to the ground right now because of the cold weather, but it's still very beautiful and something very romantic and mesmerizing about it. And if you keep walking this way, uh, you'll see the Seoul Museum of Art, which has earned a reputation as one of Korea's leading art venues with a series of world-famous exhibitions. Because it's situated in the center of Seoul and boasts outstanding collections, the museum attracts large numbers of locals and tourists. 
Then there's Cheongdong National Theater, where various events take place, from special exhibitions featuring masters of traditional arts to exhibitions of young artists. And that's why the walkway is also called Cheongdonggye. The museum holds a great historical value since it was established to restitute the legacy of Korea's first modern theater, Wangaksa. Then further on the way, uh, you'll come across with more buildings that are over a century old, like Peje Hakdang, Korea's first modern schooling institution constructed in 1895, and Cheongdongjae Church, built in 80, 1897. So it should take just about half an hour to finish the road as it stretches one kilometer uh, from the Seoul City Hall to Cheongdong National Theater. So it's a perfect place for a light stroll in the middle of Seoul. And believe it or not, there's an urban myth that all couples who walk down this road are fated to break up, which is kind of ironical considering the fact that it's one of the most romantic places in Korea. Uh, so I think the smarter way to interpret the myth is that uh, walking down the road is just one of the many obstacles in life that will make your love stronger. Uh, because if, you, if your love can beat the most notorious myth, then your love can beat anything in life. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's walk with me. This has been Chan Sung to reporting live from Doksugung Palace and back to Sunny in the studio. All right, Songjo, thank you very much for the scenes of the autumn leaves and more. It's been a week since the start of our exit strategy from the pandemic and in today's panel discussion we seek to assess current efforts to maintain a sustainable balance between our new normal and rising COVID-19 infections. I have Professor Chang Gisok from Halim University. It's good to see you again Professor Chang. Good afternoon Sunny. I also have Professor David Kwak from Sunshine University. Welcome back Professor Kwak. Good afternoon. Now, Professor Zhang, Korea's daily tally has been hovering on the 2000 level in recent days since we've started to embrace a new normal here in the country. What is your assessment of the local COVID-19 situation? Well, every, everybody supposed that uh, we're going to have a more number of confirmed cases uh, for weeks to come. Uh, only one favorable factor to suppress uh, the epidemic is completion of uh, uh, vaccination. But it reaches uh, 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 till uh, 80 percent, uh, then uh, will be uh, saturation will occur, and now it's about 76 percent or some. And we have only four percent to get to 80 uh, percent. The what 80 percent is very important is 80 percent has completed the first injection, and no more uh, increase after 80 or 81 percent. So all the other factors like uh, easing of social distancing level, loosening of alertness, including myself, and waning of antibody after, even after completion of a second shot, uh, all the other factors are in the in direction of uh, 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 increasing in numbers. So maybe uh, by the end of this week, we will see a, a figure of about uh, more than 3,000, and maybe next week, we'll see an average number will be above uh, 3,000. So we'll see. Then we have to be, still, we have to be very cautious. Right, we do. And Professor Kwak, speaking about being cautious, the number of severely ill patients is on the rise, as is that of the death toll. How do you respond? Well, I probably have mentioned this uh, sometime earlier that um, the current status of ICU bed capacity and also the mortality rate is not truly representative of, of what's going on right now in regards to the current transmission of the virus. Usually happens so uh, a few days later from the infection date. Uh, so the, the, the rise in the, uh, the mortality rates and also rise in the, uh, the ICU bed fill-ups uh, that we currently see is probably due to the accumulation of cases from past months or so. Um, it's, it's obviously going to affect in, uh, in, in the future that we have ahead of us uh, in, this, in the sense that it's still taking a toll in the capacity that we have to care for the newly incoming patients. 
but it's not representative of the current transmission. So we still have to look ahead of how we can prevent further to keep it as low as possible. Um, at the current rate, we have about 55% of um, fill-up rate in the ICU bed units. Uh, remaining seats seems to be about 511 or so. We have about 1,211 uh, ICU beds available that uh, is being ready. Um, one I think we can do is to even increase the number of ICU beds just in case, so that in case it increases or it, there's a speed of increment that increases also, that we can better be prepared for uh, that situation. But also in a sense that, uh, as um, Dr. Chung also already mentioned, we have to sort of wait and see how it comes about. Um, we have only begun and we have gotten in a week into the living with corona scheme yet. And even though we are seeing the rise in the daily confirmation case numbers, that has already begun before actually going into the living with corona or COVID scheme. And so we'd have to see, at least give it a you know, couple or three weeks to see it is actually going to increase as anticipated or as worried in the ICU bed capacity and, and the mortality as well. Currently, at least through the last week or so, the mortality that we've seen stayed around somewhere in underneath 20. Also, the ICU bed units, as uh, our, our reporter, Kwon Soa mentioned, have stayed somewhere around slightly above or less than 400 of the number. And that has been that way for the past two weeks or so. So I don't think there has been any drastic changes made to that. Even though this, the worrisome speculation is that we have incremented about 1% every day to fill up in the ICU beds, I don't think that's the uh, current status of uh, the, the ICU bed capacity, but rather something that will affect in the future, not affecting the current transmission rate. Right. And stay with ICU beds, Professor Chang. Authorities have called on hospitals here in the Greater Seoul area to secure enough beds in preparation to deal with a possible jump in daily infections as high as 7,000 cases on a daily basis. How feasible is such a preparation by medical institutions here in the metropolitan region? Well, um, the, it's an obligation for government to push uh, the hospitals to make beds. Uh, government ordered uh, to make 500 sub-ICUs for a tertiary hospital uh, around the capital area. Uh, it is conceivable that we have uh, uh, lots of ICU beds, uh, lots of uh, uh, many, many ICU patients uh, could be cared uh, well, uh, but the uh, thing is not that simple because uh, there are not many specialists on uh, critical care management. Uh, if general medicine is like uh, driving a car, uh, taking care of critical care patients like driving an airplane, how many airplanes you have, uh, you cannot, uh, you don't have a pilot, uh, pilot then you can drive an airplane. So uh, government ordered to make at least 500, and that sums up 2,000 sub ICU and ICU beds uh, uh, whole country. But how many hospital beds we have is not a problem. What is more important is do we have a real specialists, doctors and nurses who can operate ICU and who can, who can operate the equipment? So government should be very cautious in, in preparing and in ordering uh, private hospitals to make and push uh, the beds. You can, anyhow you can make uh, uh, beds, but who, can, who can take care of those critical patients? So uh, I don't think it's an appropriate order. Uh, before that, you should be very prepared for uh, a training of personnel uh, and you are uh, preparing for uh, a stepwise preparation for uh, each uh, stage for uh, 500 ICU beds, 600 uh, ICU patients, and 10, uh, 10, 1,000. So in my uh, calculation, if uh, COVID-19 uh, critical care patients exceed 1,000, uh, then uh, maybe we will see a, a temporary collapse of medical system, particularly in ICU site. I see. But at the moment, we, as Soa mentioned, we have 409 as of mm -hmm. uh, today. Professor Kwak, findings show one out of every four um, new cases involves a teenage patient. Now, schools are poised to open fully on the 22nd of this month. What do you propose to better contain transmissions among teenagers? 
Well, it's it's quite worrisome uh, that the fact that that they're they're increasing in numbers, they're increasing in the portion of daily confirmation cases is quite worrisome to us because they have a very uh, great potential potency to actually being able to transmit to other people such as family members and all elderly people and whatnot. Um, I guess still though, is, is the best method to uh, approach this matter is really uh, strong education. Letting people know the exact numbers. Uh, as we, it was reported early on in, the, in, the, in this program today, uh, up to 95% of the people involved in the college entrance assessment test, uh, including that of the senior year peop, uh, uh, high school um, people, and also the uh, teachers and staff that are involved in this, have been inoculated, show them how much of them have gotten the infection and how much of them have gotten severe from the, uh, the diseases. I would suspect that they almost know, not, not one of them, or, or at least a li very little of them would have gotten serious or infected from the disease. Um, it is quite worrisome that middle, especially middle schoolers and high schoolers are as active and as social and as transmissible as adults. Uh, that is, relatively speaking, compared to much younger children. Um, and these people, in our culture, they have to go to cram schools after um, their usual school sessions. They also gather socially very, very well uncontrollably um, uh, despite not having been inoculated. So uh, I think number one approach is better education, letting the parents and also the students, even within schools, know how, uh, how much of a benefit that the, these inoculations uh, provide them. Number two, I, I still want to go back to the physicality of this matter. Um, I think it's, we're still lacking in the sense that we're still not ventilating enough in public spaces, including that of school spaces and cram schools. Personally, I think they should just remain open 100% of all the windows uh, that are providing services to many people at once, including that of schools and cram schools. Uh, but also let people know, teach people why it should be done that way. With ventilation, there's much lesser chance for the viral transmission as opposed to people confined in a little space. So two approaches I, suggest, I would suggest here. Right, to leave the doors open then. Even during the winter though, it would be really cold. It would be really cold, I guess, but we, we have our coats. We, we have our amenities that, that could help us keep warm. So I up. think it can be managed, yes. Right. Now let's take a moment now to venture beyond national boundaries to neighboring Japan, where COVID-19 situation appears to have been brought under relative control. For more on the situation there, I have Hiroki Wada live on the line. Hiroki, it's been a while. Welcome back. Hi, Sunny. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Right. Now, Hiroki, I hear there's been a dramatic decline in daily infections over in Japan. Could you start with this reality for us and perhaps the reasons behind it? Yeah, people are really happy about the situation uh, because, as you know, uh, the daily average number of new infections right now is around 200, which is quite low from during the summer. And as for the reasons, experts, government experts are talking about a combination of some, and they talk about the higher than before injection rate of COVID-19 vaccine, and also people's uh, effort to control their behavior. But a group of researchers are also talking about some change in the Delta variant uh, replication system because there are too many errors in the in this gene and now the Delta variant cannot replicate itself properly and die out. It's one of the theories. Hiroki, I think you're breaking out because there's something wrong with your mic. Could you perhaps rearrange it and then? Okay, can you right. hear me now? I can hear you beautifully now. Okay, so you were saying sorry yes. About the, sorry about the problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. There are a number of factors affecting this dramatic drop in the number of new infections. And vaccination is one factor, as experts say, and another factor is people's extreme effort to control their behavior. And also there is a group of ex experts saying that it's because of uh, accumulated error in Delta variants uh, gene replication system. There are too many errors. Now the variant died out, but we still have to be careful and be guarded because there are other variants. Hiroki, the vaccination rate there, the public vaccination rate there, stands at 71%. Is that the accurate session right now? 
Here yeah, the latest you. number I have is like 73 yeah, yeah, I can hear you. 76% of the population in Japan has been fully inoculated then. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Um, Hiroki, how do you respond to how some critics are claiming that the fall in daily infections is also linked to a potential drop in COVID-19 testings? What are your thoughts? Right, there are a number of people who are talking about the need for more tests even before this happened. And But if you look at the numbers of tests, uh, like early in up until October, the number of tests administered was uh, as big as the number when we had more new cases. So if you look at those numbers, it's uh, a little bit difficult to uh, determine that the less number of tests is cause of less number of new cases. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the Prime Minister Kishida told a press conference earlier this month that the government intends to increase the number of free of charge tests in a bid to find uh, new cases earlier. And as you know, the Japanese government also is talking about starting booster shots as early as December. Right. And, and Hiroki, staying with booster shots, could you tell us a bit more about this campaign? I understand authorities there in Japan are planning to offer booster shots to anybody who wants it as long as their their, their second shot came eight months earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is this. Uh, they plan to start it, hopefully, in December, starting with medical practitioners who have to take care of uh, people. Now, then comes older people, elderly people, perhaps in January. Those are the periods I hear a lot in press reports, press reports. But at the same time, some experts say that probably waiting for eight months after the second shot is too late, and there may be a resurgence of new cases in the new year. Those people are saying that uh, four months wait is long enough to administer the such of the booster shot. Right, four months you said, Hiroki. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting because that is precisely something that Professor Chan said last week when he was here. He talked about the importance of implementing the booster shots four months after the second shot here in the country, right? Professor Chang, tell us more. Right. Uh, the company who made the vaccine uh, uh, procedure says that six, until six months it works. I, I admit that the uh, antibody is there, but it cannot prevent Delta infection. So another study showed that in four months' time, uh, you can prevent uh, Delta infection only by 50%. And further from uh, uh, that time, then it doesn't work. So I strongly recommend in four months' time, uh, at least uh, age 50 or more, uh, either with or without underlying disease, should be a vaccinated uh, booster uh, as early as possible from four months time instead of waiting for six months or eight eight months. Right, and staying with that, Professor Kwok, those who received the Janssen vaccine here in the country are receiving their booster shots as mentioned by our colleague Yeon earlier on. Now Moderna will, also, will be offered, but uh, Janssen recipients also have the option of choosing the Pfizer or the same Janssen vaccine. Now having said that, tell us a bit about the efficacy and safety of cross inoculation for Janssen recipients here. Right, so from the beginning, uh, when they were in comparison, Johnson & Johnson, Yan or Johnson & Johnson Janssen fell far behind that of Moderna or Pfizer shots in that they showed the efficacy of 60-something percentage as opposed to Moderna and Pfizer showing 91% to 96%. Now, going into their second inoculation, of course, Johnson Janssen being only offered for once, if they receive it once again as their booster shot, sort of as a com completion of vaccine schedule, if that was to be in other type of viral vector type, uh, that uh, boosted up to about 91% of efficacy in protection of, of uh, the virus. But, um, so we have to talk about, start talking about mix and match vaccines here, now that uh, we plan to offer either Moderna or Pfizer or even Janssen to the people who've already received their first shot. Mix and match were not ever um, completely studied through clinical trials, but rather they were compared within their antibody levels that they, prov uh, they uh, provided. 
So if, it, if, if, the, if the Janssen and Johnson Janssen was mixed with Moderna, the antibody level increased about 75 folds. With Pfizer, it increased about 36 folds. But with Janssen's second shot, it increased about four folds. Now, it's, I, would, I would still stay rather neutral on this matter because it does not necessarily equate to clinical efficacy of its protection against the virus. But having said that, we can sort of deduce its uh, efficacy or protection rate against a certain virus when we have higher levels of antibody. Not always the case, but mix and match, even before with AstraZeneca shot, has always showed greater levels of antibody or neutralizing antibody as well. So it would be more recommendable if the person is healthy and have no underlying diseases, if they can choose, mRNA types is, would possibly uh, uh, provide better protection rather than keeping in the same direction of Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine. I see. And back in Japan, Hiroki, very quickly, what is the latest with regard to COVID-19 border restrictions by authorities there? As you know, uh, the government uh, just lifted some of the <coughs> restrictions today, accepting more business travelers and foreign students and also trainees. Uh, people's opinions are divided. Uh, people more worried about the economic downturn once more business visitors and foreign workers to come to Japan to revive the economy. But at the same time, there's a number of people who are worried about uh, those new visitors contributing somehow to the resurgence of infections in Japan. But at the same time, I understand Japan and South Korean business readers uh, agreed to call for both governments to revive the mutual visits of business travelers in those countries. And the Japanese government's major came in the, right after this announcement. So we'll see what happened. And a lot depends on how the how Japan will see new infections in, in the coming months. If we have more new cases, then it's obvious that we have no choice but to, you know, come back with the restrictions. Right. Hopefully, there will be no new cases then. All right, Hiroki. As always, thank you very much for being with us live. Thank you. Right, Professor Chung, back here in the studio. Come late November, Korea itself, authorities here, will also ease border curbs, completely lift, that is, border curbs on foreign laborers in the country. What are some factors to consider to ensure safety within their working environments? Well, uh, 50,000 uh, workers are allowed to come in Korea, but uh, only six or 7,000 uh, workers are here in Korea. So there are shortages of uh, foreign laborers uh, here in Korea. So Korea is welcome, welcoming all uh, uh, 16 countries workers uh, to here. But we need to uh, uh, cover uh, some uh, disadvantage of those uh, laborers. Uh, first, uh, government should support overcoming a language barrier. And they should find, uh, uh, they should uh, have a list of uh, individual information, like a phone number and addresses. And also, uh, they need, uh, we need uh, regular tests uh, for uh, places like very vulnerable uh, places. So uh, all those factors all together then will be uh, secure. Uh, those workers working here in Korea uh, not infecting others or not getting infection from others. Right, to ensure their, sa their safety, of course, and that of those around them. All right, Professor Zhang, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. Thank and you. Professor Kwak, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Right, well, that is all the time we have for this edition of The Daily Report. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, with more coverage. Join us then.